my channel. So today's video is another solved case and I know I have done quite a few of those in the past month but you guys don't seem to mind. You guys are always asking for solved cases and they've all seemed to really fit really well in with this kind of educational theme that I've got going on and today's case is no different at all. Now I want to warn you before I get into today's case that it is incredibly brutal. It might be very triggering for someone who has dealt with bullying. Um, it's just a very, very rough case. I have known about this case for a very long time, but it has taken me probably a year and a half to build up the courage to talk about it because it is so horrific. Um, so I just wanted to warn you before I jumped into the video. So today we are covering the brutal murder of Skylar Niece. Now so much education comes out of this case. There's a lot to learn when it comes to just your personal and social life. Um, a lot to learn when it comes to trusting people, who you trust, you know, what faith you put in certain people. And also it teaches you a lot about peer pressure and what really matters when you're in middle school and high school so a lot of my younger audience will really benefit from this video I feel and on top of that there was a law that came out of this case that the parents are still pushing really hard to extend to other states so this one's just a big old bang of a case I'm interested to see what you guys have to say by the end of this video so I'm going to be talking about Skylar Neese who was 16 years old when she was brutally murdered in the summertime of 2012 now, Skylar Niece was an only child to Dave and Mary Niece, and she was the absolute light of their life. They loved her, they all had a great relationship, they were incredibly close, and they originally lived in Cheat Lake where she grew up for a good portion of her life before moving to Star City, which is I think an area inside of Morgantown, West Virginia. So she had lived in West Virginia her whole life, she just kind of moved around a few times. Now Skylar was an incredible person. She was spunky, she was hilarious, she was good to be around, she from a baby just had tons and tons of personality but on top of having such a great personality she was also incredibly intelligent she always excelled in school from a very young age and even when she went on to high school she ended up being an honor student with a 4.0 GPA at University High not only did she have a great home life but she was excelling in school she wanted to become a criminal lawyer but she also had what she considered to be a pretty great social life for the most part. Skylar ended up meeting a young girl named Sheila Eddy when she was in second grade at about eight years old in Cheat Lake where she originally lived in West Virginia. Now while Sheila and Skylar did not uh, live in the same city, they didn't go to the same school. When they met outside of all the circumstances, they still hit it off immediately. They still managed to keep in contact with each other, they always saw each other. They just connected in an awesome way. Skylar was a single child, Sheila was a single child, they kind of had a lot of the same interests, so they pretty much became inseparable from a very, very young age. And then when it came time to go to high school, despite spending the past however many years in separate schools, Sheila ended up moving to Morgantown, so both girls ended up going to University High. It was like their absolute dream come true. But this is when their duo became a trio. They ended up meeting a girl in this high school named Rachel Schoff. Now Rachel was also an only child, but a lot of her interests that she had didn't necessarily mesh with both Sheila and Skylar. Rachel was a singer, she was an actress, she was incredibly religious, she somehow Rachel managed to fit in perfectly with the group. Now all of them were inseparable. Wherever you saw one, you saw the other two. People in the school said you never saw the three of them alone ever. They were always with each other. But as I said, they got into trouble and it basically all stemmed from what I have seen from Sheila. Sheila was kind of like the badass ringleader in the group. The girls started to drink, they started to smoke weed, they started to break curfew, they started to sneak out. Now, that's not incredibly odd for high school students, but it was definitely odd for Rachel and Skylar to be doing. That's just kind of not their personality. Friends of Skylar and friends of Rachel started to notice this change in both of them, and they were honestly pretty concerned about it. They 
But at this point, Skylar had known Sheila since she was eight years old and she really looked up to her. It was pretty much her longest best friend that she had had and they had such a strong bond that she kind of just looked past it and just saw it as, hey, we're in high school, we're having fun. And Rachel, on the other hand, was usually surrounded with such a different group that this was the only group of people that she could have this type of fun with. So she was just having a good time and no one really saw any issues with what was going on. But what started out as an innocent relationship soon started to become a little bit turbulent in the summer of 2011. Nobody knew what exactly happened to the group dynamics, but pretty much everyone saw a shift in them at the school, but no one could have predicted how this friendship would end. On July 5th, 2012, Skylar finished up a shift at Wendy's and she came home, said goodnight to her parents, and went in her room, shut her door, and as everyone thought was going to happen, she went to sleep. The next day, Dave and Mary woke up and they headed out to go to work. Now, they didn't check on Skylar. Her door was shut. They assumed she was still sleeping, so they left without seeing her that morning. Now, Dave got back sometime, I'm assuming between 3 and 4 p.m., and he noticed that Skylar's door was still shut. And... This was kind of odd for her because while she did sleep in, she was never really one to sleep the whole entire day away. And she also had a shift at Wendy's at 4 p.m. that day. So he decided to go and try to wake her up. He knocked on her door a couple of times and received no answer. So he called out to her a couple of times and still no answer. So at this point, he just decided to go in the room himself. And when he opened the door, he realized that Skylar was nowhere to be found. And upon further inspection, he realized it seemed like Skylar hadn't even slept in her room the night before. So she had come home, but it appeared she just vanished after that. Now, Dave didn't immediately rush into the idea that something was wrong. He decided to call Sheila and see if maybe they were hanging out. Um, maybe she just left the house without saying anything. But when Sheila answered, she said she hadn't spoken to Skylar since about midnight the night before and she had absolutely no idea where Skylar was and she thought that Skylar was likely at home. So Dave decided to start searching her room to see if there are any clues as to what on earth might have happened, where she might have gone, and he discovered that the screen on her window had been taken off and hidden in her closet and the window was left open kind of just enough for someone to put their fingers in the window to lift it back up. And when he looked underneath the window, there was a bench there. So essentially, it appeared as if she had snuck out at some point the night before, left everything with full intentions of returning and just never come back. But he knew for sure that at 4 p.m. for her shift, she would show up because she had never ever missed a shift at work Ever. But as soon as that thought crossed his mind, he ended up getting a phone call from Wendy's asking where Skylar was and if she planned to come into her shift. At this point, Dave knew something was wrong, Mary knew something was wrong, so they called 911 to report Skylar as a missing person. And while this phone call is going on, Mary receives a phone call that made things even more confusing that she wasn't expecting. Sheila ended up calling Mary's phone and her exact words were, I have to tell you the truth about what happened last night. So Sheila goes on to tell Mary the story that Skylar herself and Rachel decided the night before to sneak out at around 11 p.m. They drove around Star City, they smoked some weed, and at about 12 a.m. they dropped Skylar back off. But they didn't drop Skylar off in the apartment parking lot. They dropped her off, I think it was about two blocks away at the end of the road because Skylar didn't want the sound of the car to wake her parents up. She said that Skylar was so incredibly scared of getting in trouble. Sheila said after they dropped Skylar off, she didn't hear from Skylar again. Now, Skylar's parents are now terrified because that means she should have shown up back at home, but based on the state of the window, the state of the screen, the state of the bench, the state of her bed, she somehow never made it the two blocks back home. So then Dave and Mary remembered that there had just been security cameras put in at the apartment complex. So at this point, they're thinking all they had to do was look at the security camera footage around 12 o'clock and they would see what might have happened to her. You know, maybe she came back, maybe she left again with the girls. Like there had to be some explanation as to where Skylar went. But when they looked into these tapes, they didn't see something that they were necessarily expecting. 
At about 12.30 a.m., a car pulls into the apartment complex. I think it was kind of like across the road from where Skylar's building was. And about five minutes later, you see Skylar running across the parking lot and willingly entering the vehicle. But this didn't make sense to the story that Sheila said. Because Sheila said that they picked her up at 11 and dropped her off at 12, but this video shows Skylar not leaving until 12.30 a.m., 30 minutes after they supposedly dropped her off. Now, authorities and family weren't exactly sure what was going on. They weren't sure if maybe she got her times wrong or what was going on, but authorities ended up chalking it up to the idea that Skylar did in fact go out with Rachel and Sheila, but she likely wasn't seen leaving or coming back somehow. And then she ended up leaving a second time to go off with somewhere else. No one could come up with another person that Skylar might have gone off with after coming home the first time. They tried really hard to get a description of the vehicle to try to figure out who on earth picked Skylar up because at this point, they no longer believed that Rachel and Sheila were the last ones to see Skylar. They believed it was some mystery person. But despite zooming in as much as they could, trying to clean up the picture as much as they could. Unfortunately, the quality of the surveillance footage was just so bad that they couldn't get anything. They couldn't get, you know, proper color of the car. They couldn't get proper model. They couldn't even get a license plate number. They couldn't even get what the rims looked like. Absolutely nothing. Now, this was a crucial period in the search for Skylar because at this point, the only information they have is that she left willingly. And because of this information, they were not able to put out an Amber Alert. So she was pretty much being treated like a runaway because at this point, there was absolutely no evidence to suggest otherwise. But this really forced her parents to do a lot on their own. They went and begged her to come home on the news. They put pleas out on social media to her friends. They just kept reminding Skylar that she wouldn't be in trouble. They just wanted her home. They just wanted her safe. They would receive phone calls from people claiming to have all sorts of sightings. There was even a sighting as far south as North Carolina. And, you know, they always went out to these just to double check everything. But unfortunately, none of the sightings ended up being... Skylar. Some of her other friends were desperate as well. They figured that maybe she got into a fight with somebody or maybe she had issues at home and she had ran away, but they all knew the relationship that she had with her parents and knew that she would eventually come home. There would be no way that she would hurt her parents like that. There would be no way she would stay away for very long. That just wasn't her personality. They sent multiple messages to Skylar on Facebook trying to encourage her to talk to them or talk to somebody, but unfortunately nobody received a response. Once Skylar got into that car, everything went quiet. No activity on her phone, no activity on social media, absolutely nothing. Sheila was incredibly helpful in the search. She maintained constant communication with Dave and Mary. She always was asking for updates. She was always asking what she could do. She was printing out posters and helping put out posters. She even showed up a few days after Skylar went missing to the niece home, asked if she could just go sit on Skylar's bed and have a moment. And she went in the bedroom and had a complete breakdown. It was very obvious to the nieces that she was incredibly emotionally upset. Mary sat beside her and really tried to comfort her, but Rachel seemed to be handling things very differently. She was incredibly quiet. If there was anything about Skylar anywhere, she made sure that she stayed very, very far away from it. She even spent the day after Skylar went missing out on the lake, on a boat on the lake with her family and a few family friends. While she seemed to be in an okay mood, according to all of them, she did appear to be on her phone frantically texting a lot of the day. And then she eventually went on to a church camp as planned, despite finding out that her best friend had gone missing. She just seemed to be coping with everything in a very different way. Now, normally when a teenager goes missing, after a couple of days, more often than not, they end up coming back but Skylar seemed to not be appearing anywhere. Authorities weren't finding any leads, and at this point, the family started to really question the idea that she had ran away. She hadn't taken her phone charger with her. She hadn't taken her contact solution. She hadn't taken money. She took absolutely nothing that indicated that she was planning on staying away for any period of time. And then based on every single clue in her room, she had full intentions of being back that night. 
And it didn't seem to help that theories were just running rampant everywhere between authorities' theories, between high schoolers. We all know how that can go. Crazy things can start going and then it just tumbles on from there. There were so many people that believed she had gotten drunk, maybe passed out and hit her head somewhere. There were a lot of people that believed she was followed and then abducted. I mean, all of these things without really any sort of evidence behind them. It was just people's speculation. And then there were two banks that ended up being robbed in a nearby town. And it was said that the money was used to purchase drugs for a teenage party. And it was a town that a lot of the kids often went to for parties. So then there were a lot of people that believed, including authorities, that she got a hold of these drugs, maybe overdosed on heroin. There was this rumor floating, floating around that after she overdosed, everyone got scared. So they just went and dumped her somewhere. But they weren't able to find pretty much anything solid in any of these leads. And unfortunately, when you're working with a group of teenagers like this, the theories and stories that can be created are just endless. While Sheila did seem to get Skylar into some of these unsavory activities, sometimes these theories just didn't seem like Skylar at all. And a lot of people believed if any of these were true, there had to be evidence somewhere. There had to be someone that knew something in the school. Someone likely would have come forward at this point. So no one really knew what to believe. So the obvious first step in an investigation is going to the last people that the person was known to be with. And since they hadn't identified who whoever this person or people were that picked her up at 12.30 in the morning, they decided to go ahead and question Rachel and Sheila. Their interviews were a little bit odd, to say the very least. Sheila seemed to be almost entirely void of emotion, which was odd to a lot of people because she seemed to be overly emotional, just incredibly emotional on social media. She would see Mary and Dave niece. So the fact that she was super emotional, you know, when talking to the parents and on social media, and then she gets in front of authorities and seemed like completely blank, that was just kind of a red flag to authorities. And then on top of that, she seemed way more interested in the investigation and asking what the authorities were doing than, you know, her friend or answering any questions about what they did that night or any of that. She just seemed to want to know what authorities were doing, what they planned on doing next, and that was another red flag to them. They weren't able to get in touch with Rachel until the day after they talked to Sheila, and I think at this time Rachel was in the church camp. I cannot 100% say that as a fact, but either way, Rachel acted like she had no idea that Skylar was missing. She acted like it was the very first she had heard of it. Uh, and you know, while that would seem a little bit odd, these girls were in constant communication. All of them talked all the time. And Rachel had been at home the day that Skylar went missing. You would assume that from the second Sheila knew, which was incredibly early, she came over right after Skylar was reported a missing person, Rachel would know. But somehow, apparently, there was no communication and authorities found that odd as well. And then during her interview, when they finally were able to sit down with her, she was acting incredibly nervous, which no, is not necessarily out of the realm of possibilities. I know that most people get nervous when they're talking to authorities. And on top of that, to make things more suspicious, their stories were exactly the same. And not in the way that you would hope, in a way that, you know, you would be like, okay, well, this is definitely what happened. Their stories were verbatim, almost like they had rehearsed it. This is when everyone started to look directly at the two girls. Their behavior just seemed to be very, very odd. Dave and Mary did come forward about some of their true feelings about Sheila. They said that Sheila was basically another daughter to them. They had known her as long, obviously, as Skylar had known her, but they did acknowledge the fact that she had really involved Skylar and a lot of behavior that they weren't necessarily pleased with. They had found a Skylar with weed one time and Skylar said that Sheila was the one who encouraged her to have it and gave it to her. But they kind of showed it off as, you know, teenagers being teenagers and this was Skylar's best friend. And then more people started coming out of the woodworks talking about Sheila and it really kind of led to more unsettling information and really put the spotlight even further on Sheila. Everyone that knew Sheila described her as, and I quote, the root of all evil. 
That's terrifying. They also described her as sketchy and shady and manipulative. She always wanted the attention on her. She always wanted things to go her way. And she would pretty much do anything at all to get what she wanted. Now, one of Skylar's friends in particular had a very interesting story to tell. Apparently, Skylar had confided in her. According to this friend, Skylar was incredibly upset in the past few months, pretty much, before her disappearance. Skylar told her friend she had been best friends with Sheila since she was eight years old, and they had only just met Rachel, but she felt like she was being pushed out of the friend group. She could feel that Rachel and Sheila were becoming incredibly close. She felt like her best friend was being taken away from her, and there was nothing she could do about it. Skylar was basically becoming a third wheel. Rachel and Sheila would show up in matching outfits all the time and when Skylar would ask, you know, why didn't you tell me we used to do this together? Like, you didn't let me know. I would have matched you. They would brush it off with, oh, it was totally just a coincidence. What it obviously wasn't. And then on top of that, they would take pictures together. They took tons of selfies together. I mean, you know how teenage girls are, but you could see a change in the pictures as well. And it was, it's almost eerie to look at. Um, whereas all three of them used to be front and center, all hanging off of each other, you know, all great friends. And you slowly started to see Skylar being pushed out of the picture. You saw Rachel and Sheila kind of hanging off each other and really putting themselves front and center in the pictures. And then you'd see Skylar, like half of her face in the back, trying to be a part. You know, it just was weird and eerie and a lot of people were noticing it and so was Skylar. But she was so desperate to hang on to this relationship with someone that she had been best friends with for most of her life. Authorities decided to start playing around with the idea that there were problems in the friendship groups. They started going through Skylar's social media to see if there were any hints left behind and they really found a mother load. The weeks prior to her disappearance, Skylar was very upset and angry. She posted lots of tweets saying that people were mean for no reason. She posted a tweet that said, you know, there was something about someone that she couldn't stand. All very like passive aggressive tweets that were definitely directed at someone, but she never said who. And then at 1040 the night that she went missing, she said, and I quote, you doing blank like that is why I will never completely trust you. So there was someone that was pissing her off, being mean to her, losing her trust. Skylar was having issues with someone. But then they found a video that kind of made everyone's hair stand up on the back of their neck. Skylar had taken a video of a game that she was playing with Rachel and Sheila. Sheila was standing up while the girls were sitting down and it was kind of like a would you rather game but on a terrifying level. Would you guys rather suffocate or get shot? Get shot. Shot. As, wait, it depends on where. Would you rather, in the head? Shot. shot. There would be no suffering at all. Eaten by ants or suffocated? Suffocated. suffocated. Drowning or suffocating? Suffocating. It's almost the same thing. I know, but it's not. At this point, there were enough red flags for authorities to want to dig deeper into Rachel and Sheila. So they decided to go ahead and look into their phones. There was no mention of Skylar from the time that she disappeared on. They were supposedly hanging out with Skylar around that time. There was no mention of her. And right after that, Skylar was known to be missing. And you would assume that two best friends that just lost their third best friend would be texting about it. They would be upset. They would be trying to figure things out together. But there was no text about her at all. It was almost as if they were trying to completely avoid talking about her altogether through text messages. Skylar's parents were not happy at first that authorities seemed to be kind of narrowing in on these girls because they believed these poor girls had nothing to do with Skylar's disappearance. They thought that they were being unfairly focused on and, you know, these are 16 year old girls. They are probably scared. They're probably going through a lot of emotions. So Skylar's parents told them to back off. They said, you know, leave these girls alone, lay off. They're going through a lot right now. But while they were doing so much to protect these two girls they thought to be innocent, authorities were finding a lot of clues to point that they might not be as innocent as they seem. 
And the girls' very robotic versions of the story of what happened that night, they said that they stayed within Star City when they were on their little joy ride. Authorities just wanted to make sure and double check they really did stay within Star City. They wanted to know their route. They wanted to know more information about this drive. So they scoured through, honestly, probably hundreds of videos of surveillance footage from businesses in the local area and hopes to spot the car somewhere. And sure enough, they were able to find it. And finally, at 12.39 a.m., Sheila's car was spotted heading north out of Star City. Now, while there was a chance Skylar wasn't with them at this point because it was 40 minutes after she was technically dropped off and about nine minutes after she was picked up by what they thought to be someone else. Still just wanted to double check what exactly the girls were doing at this point. And they found out that the girls did not just, you know, go a little bit out of Star City. They went 45 minutes away to a town called Blacksville. Authorities at this point wanted to know why, because they had claimed that night after this drive, they never left Star City. So what exactly took them 45 minutes away? When Rachel and Sheila were questioned about this. Their prior rehearsed word for word stories started to crumble apart. Sheila claimed that at this point they had already taken Skylar home and she said it was just her and Rachel in the car and Skylar wasn't there. But Rachel had a very different story. Rachel said, oh yeah, you know, I totally forgot that we went to Blacksville. Oh, I just, you know, slipped my mind. Whoops, sorry. But yes, Skylar was with us. So now two people claiming to be in the same car at the same time had two completely different stories on whether Skylar was with them or not. Once Sheila found out that Rachel had changed her story saying that Skylar was with them, she changed her story as well to say, oh no, you're right, you're right. Like, oh, we definitely did have her in the car with us, but what really happened is that we were in a town called Brave, which is right over the border of West Virginia and Pennsylvania. And she said that at this point, Skylar for some reason jumped out of the car and ran into the woods and they couldn't find her. Their stories were just clearly falling apart out of total desperation. The girls at this point seemed like they were starting to really flounder, but Sheila was pretty adamant on the fact that she wasn't lying despite the fact that her story changed. So she stepped up to take a polygraph test and she failed horribly. And Rachel ended up saying that she would take a polygraph test as well. But while on the way to this test in her father's car, she jumped out of the moving vehicle and ran. She literally jumped from a moving car to avoid taking a polygraph test. At this point, authorities felt that the girls had acted oddly enough to bring up the idea that they might know something or maybe be involved in Skylar's disappearance to Dave and Mary. Now, despite the fact that Dave and Mary had gone to bat for them already, told authorities to lay off of them, they clearly had enough doubts in their mind that they did not refuse this idea or possibility at all. And instead, they went and started pushing to see if they could get anything out of the girls. Now, they knew that the best way to get information out of them was to really put a lot of pressure on them. And what's the best way to do that other than social media? media. They started writing on Facebook about karma and how it comes back to bite you. They started saying that, you know, the girls need to come forward if they have any sort of information. And once Dave and Mary started posting about this, other people that had suspicions joined in as well. And eventually a ton of people from the school, a ton of different parents really started putting pressure on the girls as well. There were even anonymous tweets sent out to the girls saying, pretty little liars keep on lying. The pressure was really on for these girls and everyone kept pushing hoping that it would eventually make these girls crack. Even the people that were incredibly close to both Sheila and Rachel were asking and wondering what on earth they were hiding. It was just that obvious that they knew at least something that they were keeping to themselves. And then Rachel cracked and in a very big and scary way. She had an absolute nervous breakdown around six months after Skylar went missing. Um, the 911 call is disturbing to say the least. 
Uh, her mother ended up calling into 911 saying that Rachel was running around the neighborhood, that she could no longer get control of her daughter. She had been trying, but her daughter was entirely out of control. In the 911 call, Rachel hits her mom in the face and gives her a black eye. You can hear her screaming. Um, very disturbing, but clearly Rachel was very suicidal and she was not all right. So authorities came and immediately took her to the hospital. Now, something happened in this hospital that to this day has not been released. Um, but instead of being taken straight home after being released from the hospital, instead, Rachel was taken straight to the police department and her very first words upon entering the building were, we stabbed her. On January 16th, 2013, this day that Rachel walked into the police department and admitted to stabbing Skylar, the story of what happened finally started to come out and it was, unbelievable. At this point, authorities had an idea that maybe the girls knew something, but none of them ever expected Rachel to walk in and claim that the girls had killed her. So it took a minute for everyone to gather themselves, but they finally all sat down to hear what Rachel had to say. Rachel stated that she and Sheila had been planning to kill Rachel for months, like almost a year. They had spent planning to kill her. They both decided that they couldn't use a gun because neither of them knew how to use one, so they would have to use a knife, and they planned all the different ways they were going to you know, possibly dispose of her body, the different ways they would minimize the amounts of evidence left behind. And after months of careful planning, Rachel was the one who finally decided it was time to go. Apparently, she wanted to go ahead and get it over with before she went to her two-week church camp. They packed all the supplies in the car, and I think they put everything in the trunk. It included a shovel, paper towels, bleach, wipes, a change of clothes, and they both wore sweatshirts, and in their sweatshirts, they put kitchen knives that I'm fairly certain came from Sheila's kitchen, according to Rachel. They decided that their way to lure Skylar out of the house was with weed and promising to go have a good time, drive around in the middle of the night, go smoke somewhere. And apparently originally Skylar didn't want to go out, but after a lot of texts between the two that authorities had seen, they finally convinced her to. So at around 12.30, they went and picked Skylar up. So this entire time, the car they saw at 12.30 was Sheila's car. So Sheila's story of picking Skylar up at 11 and dropping her off at 12, according to Rachel, was a bunch of BS. They decided to drive out of the city and even out of the state to Pennsylvania, and they went to a town called Brave. Now, this is where Sheila made that story up saying that Skylar had gotten out of the car and run into the woods and that they couldn't find her, but this wasn't necessarily a random location. Apparently, Sheila's family has a lot of land in Brave. So they went to one of the roads near her family's land, a place where they knew no one would be, um, a place they were very familiar with, and it was a very remote, grassy area. I'm pretty sure it was just, you know, a gravel road, and I think they drove about a mile down this road and then they stopped the car and all decided to get out. Now they sat around and talked for a little bit but once they wanted to go ahead and smoke both Sheila and Rachel said they didn't have a lighter so obviously Skylar offered to go to the car to get her lighter and this is when they decided to execute their plan. As soon as Skylar turned her back the girls counted to three and then on a pre-planned signal after counting to three, they ran and started to stab and attack Skylar. Now, Skylar managed to get away for a second and she ran for her life, literally, but Rachel ran after her and ended up tackling her to the ground and they continued to stab her. Now, I have seen very different numbers on how many times Skylar was stabbed. Um, I've heard as high as 50, maybe more, but the girls didn't think that was enough, so they decided to slit her throat because they had read online that that would kill someone 
faster. The original plan was to bury Skylar so she wouldn't be found, but this area was right beside a creek, so there were a ton of rocks, it was really, really hard ground, and they weren't able to dig any of the ground up. So instead, they just kind of dragged her right off of the road. I think it wasn't even six steps away from the road, and they covered her with, you know, the grass and sticks and rocks to make sure that she wasn't seen. At this point, they cleaned themselves up. They went and washed themselves off entirely in the creek. They put on new clothes and they wiped everything down just like nothing had even happened. But a confession wasn't enough for authorities because at this point, they had absolutely no physical evidence. They had absolutely no body, nothing. And Sheila hadn't admitted to anything. This was only Rachel. They were hoping that Rachel could give them insights as to where the knives were or where their clothes were or anything, but according to her, Sheila had taken care of all of those things. She had no idea where she had put any of them. There were a whole bunch of rumors floating around in regards to that. The stories on that changed a whole bunch of times. But the one thing Rachel was able to do was lead authorities straight to the body. But still, they had no way at all to connect Sheila directly to the murder because Rachel at this point was the only one that had confessed. So they were hoping what they'd be able to do was wire Rachel and send her to hang out with Sheila. And they were hoping that Rachel could strike up a conversation about the murder and they would be able to have Sheila recorded admitting to what she did. But Sheila was too smart for that and she would not take the bait. She had no idea that Rachel had a wire on her, nothing. She literally just acted like she had no idea what Rachel was talking about and completely moved on. And Rachel just kind of went with the flow. They took selfies together that night. They posted selfies. Keep in mind, Rachel had literally just been released from a mental hospital. Sheila was posting on Twitter and Facebook, finally reunited with my Rach. Like they were smiling. They were having a great time. And Sheila had no idea. And Rachel surely wasn't acting like they had just found Skylar's body. But now that authorities had the body, they were at least able to go to Dave and Mary and tell them that unfortunately, their daughter had been found and she had in fact been brutally murdered. Nobody at this time knew who the two suspects were because both Sheila and Rachel were minors. Their names couldn't be released until they were actually charged with a crime. When the news came out, the day the news came out that Skylar was found and she had been murdered, she immediately went on to her Twitter and under a blanket of safety, started to tweet that it was the worst day of her life, that Skylar would always be her best friend, that she was going to miss her forever, that the pain was so incredibly real and she didn't know how she could go on living like that. And as if that's not like terrifying and messed up because from what authorities knew at that point, she was one of the ones responsible and she was telling everyone, you know, this was the worst day ever. You know, she was being consoled on all of this from, you know, different friends and other family members, people that were family members of Skylar. It was just a mess. And in between all of these tweets about being so sad and upset, she was tweeting things to totally antagonize the police department. She was tweeting things like, I wonder if there is a law and order SVU where they don't figure it out. And then probably the most disturbing tweet yet, and keep in mind, amongst these other rest in peace tweets was, we really did go on three. Like, it was a freaking game to Sheila, an absolute game. Without even knowing it, she basically confirmed Rachel's story because she was agreeing that they went on three and she was referencing a murder that she committed on a public platform on a day that the body was found. It's just like something that is so beyond me and that I cannot understand and wrap my head around. But she wouldn't win, despite the fact that she clearly felt untouchable. Authorities didn't need her confession anymore like they had originally hoped to get because they had done a forensic examination on her car and they had found blood splatters in the back of her trunk. And once the forensic examination results came back, the blood matched the blood of Skylar niece. They finally had enough. 
At this point, Rachel came in willingly and turned herself in and was arrested right on the spot. And authorities wanted to find Sheila before she heard of this news and had any chance to kind of run away. So Sheila ended up being arrested shortly after Rachel was in custody in the middle of a Cracker Barrel parking lot. And she was taken straight to jail. Now, when the girls were asked why on earth they murdered Skylar, their answer was simply that they just didn't like her. When the community figured out who these killers were, shock set in all over because Rachel was obviously arrested first and at this point her name was made public. Now Sheila hadn't been arrested yet or charged with anything yet so there was just this person floating around in the air but everyone already knew if Rachel was involved that meant Sheila was as well. Same girls that have been crying out in pain all over social media about missing their best friend and about rest in peace this and rest in peace that. This is when Mary realized that one of her daughter's killers came and sat on her bed days after stabbing her to death and she consoled her. Like, can you even imagine what that must have felt like finding that out? And those that were closest to the girls were also confused because they had seen both of them just hours after this happened. Rachel had been on a boat with her family hours after this happened. There is a picture from being on the boat. And if you were to look at her, you never would have known. The girls didn't skip a beat at all after brutally murdering their best friend. Authorities and everyone knew that there had to be more to the story. It wasn't as simple as they just didn't like her. So they decided to dig a little bit deeper because a part of obviously the trial, they needed to be able to prove a motive. That's like the biggest thing that they needed to have. They ended up finding one in Skylar's diary. So in the summer of 2011, when everything apparently started to get rocky in the friendship, there was a specific event that caused it all. The girls were having a sleepover one night and they had all been drinking and a very unexpected thing happened. Sheila and Rachel apparently had a sexual relationship and on this particular night, they started to get intimate and Skylar pretty much realized it for the first time. Now, I don't know if the girls knew that she was awake. I don't know if she was asleep or if they just did it and didn't care that she was in the room, but she couldn't leave the room and was pretty much forced to watch it because they had all been drinking and if she left the room, the parents would know that she was drunk and they all would get in trouble. Now, ultimately this ended in a giant fight. Um, pretty much the same night or maybe the early morning of the sleepover, Sheila and Skylar went at it. That was kind of what started all the issues in the friendship. Authorities checked Skylar's social media on the date after this supposedly happened and found a tweet from Skylar that said she would tell the whole school what she had on everyone and that it was a lot. So basically she was threatening to tell their secret that they had a sexual relationship. Now despite the fight, despite the fact that Skylar had this information on the girls, they still remained friends and acted civil pretty much. They still considered themselves the Three Musketeers, but what Skylar didn't know is that Rachel and Sheila had had enough of her. The following October was the first time that Sheila and Rachel had a conversation in the middle of a science class in school about hiding a body. But not just hiding any body, about specifically hiding Skylar and how to kill her. But still, they continued being her friend. But then in June of 2012, it was kind of the final straw for Sheila. Skylar and Sheila went to Myrtle Beach that June and they were together for about a week. And apparently this entire week was horrible because it had been almost a year at this point of tension building and fights happening and a lot of issues. Skylar was being pushed out of the friendship because Rachel and Sheila were so close and they argued the entire time. Now around the time that this was happening, Skylar posted another tweet that said, just know I know. So she was kind of antagonizing the girls about this information that she had on them. And when Sheila got back from this trip, she went straight to Rachel and she said, Skylar has to die. Now authorities believe that Sheila and Rachel acted out of desperation to keep basically their secret. They didn't want anyone to know about their sexual relationship, but I personally think that's a bunch of BS. If you are so desperate to keep a secret, you don't wait an entire year to act 
act on it. It just doesn't seem like a desperation-based crime. It seems like it was fun for them. It seems like they thought it was an absolute freaking game. An entire year of tricking Skylar into thinking that, you know, yeah, they had problems, but they were still her best friend, while still also plotting that entire year to kill her. On May 1st, 2013, Rachel pled guilty to a second-degree murder and publicly apologized to Skylar's family. Skylar's dad happily told her to sit on her apology because that's about all it was worth. I'm fairly certain that Rachel was tried as a juvenile and I know that she was held in a detention center and then she eventually was transferred to an adult prison. Um, Sheila, on the other hand, did not apologize at all for what she did. The first couple of court appearances, she did not appear remorseful whatsoever. She almost seemed, again, like it was a joke. Um, she pled not guilty at first. She wasn't upset. Uh, it wasn't until she came in the day that she pled guilty that she kind of seemed upset, but a lot of people believe it had nothing to do with what she did. She was upset because she realized it was her only option. A lot of people went at Sheila for not apologizing to Mary and Dave for murdering their daughter, but Mary and Dave have said that they don't want her apology because that would be like a last slap in the face because they strongly believe she 100% meant to do it. She would likely do it again if she was given the chance and there's no way that she was actually sorry. Honestly, both girls got off very freaking easy for the level of brutality of the murder of Skylar. They could have, and they were originally both going to be charged by Pennsylvania and West Virginia because of the fact that it was two separate states, the double jeopardy law wouldn't matter. You can't be tried for the same thing in the same state, but both states in this case could have easily charged them both for murder and abduction. But they both ended up taking plea deals, Rachel first, that got them out of being charged by Pennsylvania as well. Now probably one of the most disturbing things that came out, um, and I feel like something that a lot of you guys could learn from, uh, is that apparently, and I'm not sure if this came out in trial, um, or during the trial, I do know that this information did come out publicly. I just don't know if it was used in trial. Apparently, many students and even a teacher heard both Sheila and Rachel talk about killing Skylar. It wasn't like this was entirely a secret. There had been multiple people that overheard these conversations and plans to kill her, but they all assumed that it was a joke. I guess when they first started their conversation in October, they were in a science class that was talking about forensic examinations and all sorts of things, so they believed it was just kind of part of the conversation. I guess there was a body found behind the school a couple of weeks before, so everyone just brushed off the fact that these girls were talking about murdering their best friend. Not a single person that heard it reported it. And had they, this might have completely changed things. You know, I feel like we all are scared to get other people in trouble. We are scared to bring things to light. But when you hear someone talking about something like that, it's the same as when you hear someone joke about suicide. It's not funny. It is always better safe than sorry. I would rather call someone out a hundred times and be proven wrong than not do anything about it and then something horrific like this happen later on. It's just not worth it. And I feel like I remember being in those situations in high school, times where I probably should have reported something, but I just, you know, really shrugged it off. I thought it was a joke. I thought it was this. Don't take it like that. Be smart and be responsible and tell an adult. Sheila is serving a life sentence and Rachel is serving 30 years. As I said, she originally started off in a juvenile center and she was moved to an adult center. Um, I think they both are eligible for parole in their early 30s, which again, is terrifying. But Dave has said that he will make sure he is at every single parole hearing to make sure that neither one of these monstrous young women are released at all. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Skylar's parents went on after she was murdered to pass Skylar's law in West Virginia. Now, a lot of you guys are going to be incredibly excited about this law. I get a lot of questions all the time about Amber Alerts and why an Amber Alert wasn't set out for, you know, one child and was for the other. I feel like there's a lot of um, confusion surrounding an Amber Alert. I feel like a lot of people are upset because an Amber Alert doesn't cover every single child, but Skylar's law kind of covers that. 
app for West Virginia. It would enable public notification for missing child cases that don't quite meet the criteria for an Amber Alert. It basically takes away the burden of proof of an abduction. So if you are not aware of what the Amber Alert requires, a child has to be believed to be abducted, a child has to be under 18 years old, has to be known that the child may be in danger of death or at least serious injury, and there needs to be sufficient enough information to prove that an Amber Alert would be helpful. And most of the time, under this particular requirement, they need a car description, they need a description of the person that took this child. So basically, a child has to be known to have been abducted. It has to be witnessed, there has to be some sort of threat that was made, there has to be some sort of information out there. So when a child goes missing under bizarre circumstances, like Skylar's case, for instance, where she just walked off and it appeared she willingly walked off, um, or you know, maybe a child was home alone and just vanished, because no one was there to say if there was an abduction or not, that person, that child wouldn't have an alert sent out for them. And unfortunately, we know how time is of the essence in these cases, and this alert allows people to immediately be notified. People cannot help. The public cannot do anything unless they know. And in a lot of these cases, they don't know that there's a child missing. I'm, and maybe it's just because of what I do, but I constantly, I'm terrified that there has been some point in my life where I have seen an abducted child and I haven't known because that child didn't qualify for an Amber Alert. And it doesn't mean that they weren't abducted. It just means no one witnessed it. Or, you know what I mean? It could be the smallest thing. So this law will help so many children be found more successfully because people will know what to look out for. People will be aware. Now, this law was signed into this law was signed in 2017, so I'm unsure how much of a difference it's made. I would love to give you guys statistics. I just don't have any right now. I personally believe it has made a huge difference. There was a lot of kind of pushback at this law at first because unfortunately, when you kind of bombard the public with missing persons cases, they pay less attention. I still believe, despite the fact that a lot of people might ignore some of these alerts, that it would still be highly, highly beneficial. And I think it's very unfair to not give other kids a chance because of reasons like that. Dave and Mary hope that this law will extend to other states and protect as many children as possible. Um, and I agree, this reminds me a lot of the Ashanti alert. A lot of the times in cases that we cover, we always say, if there was just an alert for this person, like they fall in such a weird category, you know, maybe this could have saved them, maybe this could have done something. And it's laws like this that are filling in those cracks now that we're seeing that hopefully will drastically change the way missing children's and missing young adults cases are handled. Now, this is basically just the bare minimum of diving into this case. There is a lot more information, there is a lot of theories and speculation out there that I personally didn't want to dig into. Um, if you guys would like to read a book on this case, there is a book that's been written called Pretty Little Killers, and that dives really deep into the case. There is also a website called Skylar Nice Murder, I will have that link down below. That person has basically compiled as much information as possible onto the website. Um, you learn a little bit more more about different circumstances within the case and the girl specifically. But if you want to dive deeper into the case, this is definitely one that you can do. It just keeps on going despite the fact that it's solved. And I guess now we just have to sit back and hope that neither one of these women are released from prison in their early 30s because to me, again, that was not a desperation kill. Sheila had way too much fun. I think it's possible that Rachel maybe feels remorseful. Then again, she was an actress, so a lot of people believe she was just leading everybody on. But Sheila, to me, I just don't think she gives a crap whatsoever, and it's terrifying to know that someone like that might possibly be put back on the street. So definitely one that I'm going to keep my eye on as well. I hope you guys learned a lot from this video. If you are someone that is in middle school or high school, Think about everything that I just went through. Choose your friends very, very, very carefully. Be smart, 
be responsible. As always, if you guys can, leave some positive comments down below, maybe something nice that you would like for parents to read if they stumble across this video. Try to keep it respectful and calm. Thank you guys so, so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Skylar's story. And again, I hope you took something from this video. Don't forget to hit the like button if you guys are enjoying this educational kind of series that I have going on right now. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Howland fam if you're not already, so we can hopefully bring them home together and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!